so I'm going to talk to you about operable Erlang and Elixir. There's going to be some content in there that overlaps a bit what uh, Maxim has just presented, but I'm going to be a bit, uh, acting a bit at a higher level. So one of the things that we are always told to do when we want something that's easy to debug is to keep it simple, right? The idea is that if we do something complex that requires to be clever to do it, it's going to be super hard to debug, so we have to keep it simple. The problem with that is that some complexity cannot be avoided. This might be a, fight, uh, a fine system if you're having a web store, for example, that, that, that receives 15 requests uh, a week or something like that. But if I'm telling you that I have a web store that receives thousands and thousands of orders uh, per hour, and that a, a team of 40 people have their livelihood based on the system, and I tell you that this is my architecture, you're either not going to believe me or you're going to consider me to be entirely irresponsible. So there is a requirement that when we have more people, we require more complexity as a system is used. Right? There's no way that WhatsApp only has one big machine with a label web server on top of it. I thought they wish. <laughs> they might be. <laughs> so you do have more complexity. And if you get into redundant regions, then you have to care about stuff like DNS being done differently, load balancers. And this is still a simplified diagram. But it gets to be a lot more complex. When data doesn't fit one big database, then you need to start sharding it to split it to have replication in all kinds of places, and it starts being a bit different and harder. The behavior of the big system is not the same as the behavior of the small system, and we cannot keep the small system forever. Complexity is mandatory for some kinds of loads. And so I'm, give, I'm going to use quotes from the Systems Bible by John Gall here and there. It's a fantastic book full of good uh, but sarcastically uh, mentioned uh, con concepts in there. And so the first one is a simple system may or may not work. There is never a guarantee that a system works at all, but a system one might work. A complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved by a small system that worked. A complex system designed from scratch never works and cannot be made to work. You have to start over beginning with a simple working system. And so essentially, uh, this is also connected to the second system syndrome. If you have a simple system, you decide to make a more complex one on the side, you have to do it pi uh, part by part. You cannot just ship the big thing and hope it works the first time around. We, we're just not good enough to do that. And a large system produced by expanding the dimension of a smaller system does not behave like this small system. As I've mentioned, uh, doing a reporting query on my web store in here might just be a big select statement in SQL and then I get all the data I need. This might no longer work in, under that infrastructure. Uh, but the, the, the behavior that changes is not just the feature that are possible or not, it's also the way that the systems fail. And so the failures of the, thing, uh, of the small system are not going to be the same failures of the large system. And so we need to have trained operators that are able to deal with the, the increase in complexity. So we might want to get back to our simple system that's going to be fine for what we have. Uh, let's say that there is a bug in the system. How do I fix it? Well, the first thing I need to do is be aware of whether the system is healthy or not. There might be a bug, but if nobody's looking at it and nobody's using it, I don't know there is a bug. And so we have the concept of monitoring. And monitoring is essentially asking the question, how are you doing? You're just asking, you know, how are you doing? You're feeling good today. It tells you yes or no. Uh, you had a little input that's going to be an HTTP request or something like that. It's just asking for the status, and it tells you yes or no. Essentially, you're taking the, the temperature of the system. If you see, if the node tells you it's sick, it's not feeling well, you don't know why. That's why you have observability, which essentially is asking the question, um, what are you doing? You've got high temperature. Why is it that way? Did you just do exercise? Are you sick? Do you have a flu or something like that? Observability is about making the diagnosis. And it comes from control theory. A bunch of engineers, like real engineers working real, with real hardware, and yeah, not software. That's not real engineering. And ah, stop laughing, that's true. It's not real engineering. Uh, and um, you have, for example, speed control or flight stabilizer. And observability tells you that if you only look at the output of the system, you are able to infer the internal state that the system had. We visibly cannot do this in software because sometimes all you get is a 502 bad gateway and nobody knows why that is. So what we do is that we cheat. We pretend we are real engineers. We just add more output and then we pretend that we can reverse it and that software observability. We just throw our output even though the users don't see it. And so let's say I have that. Then my system like that is no longer the system I'm operating. I need more components to be able to deal with that. And so I grow the definition of my system. I have a bunch of green components that are related to getting all these metrics, the monitoring, the logging, that kind of stuff. I have to have a way to put code on there. Otherwise, there's nothing to fix, right? It's not burnt into persistent memory, and then you never change it. And if I have these components access to the servers, I also have to care about the code. 
And then the code are your yellow components that has to do with development. But that is still an incomplete view of my system. My system has people writing the code, has people understanding all the metrics and all of that stuff. And so this is a more complete vision of what the system is. And there's a bunch of pink people in there and they're doing the important stuff. And not everyone has the same perspective and the same point of view of what is going on. The little dude on the top left is not necessarily going to have the same vision as the three developers. And everyone is still having an impact on the system. The little person on the top right is not touching any of the components, but they might still have a disastrous impact on the system or a marvelous one. They might be a salesperson that sells a feature without telling anyone. They might be a CEO who just changes the budgets and they have a huge impact on the system. And there's a big amorphous blob of communication channels and that turns out to be super important. And so if I want to make a system operable, I have to think of the system not just as the components, but with the interactions that it has with the people in there. And so how do we debug a system has to do with the point of view that we have in the system with there. The person on the top left is not going to debug it the same way that the three people developing the code are doing to do it. And, luck, and, and with any kind of luck, the person on the top right is not going to debug it at all. So the way we work is that we have a kind of map, a conception of what is into the system. And this is not the city of London. This is a map of the city of London. You don't see the people. You don't know which restaurants are good or not. But it is a very detailed map. It has streets. It has uh, train stations. It has uh, piers in there. It has the rivers. It has colors for buildings. It has all kinds of information. This I would compare to the source code. The source code is not what is running in production. You have specific artifacts in specific environments. But it is extremely detailed, and pretty much nobody knows it by heart. And by the way, source code also includes the operating system. We are taking on the responsibility of everything we ship. Uh, if there is a bug in Linux or something like that, it's certainly not the marketing folks who are going to debug it. It's going to be the developers anyway. So this is the kind of understanding that we have, or that we wish we had. In fact, the kind of mental map and the, the understanding we have of the system is much closer to this. And if you look into the diagrams that we had and when we describe, sy describe systems, this is the kind of stuff we do. It's not like this. It's more like that. Right? And so this is a tourist map of London. It is entirely inaccurate. All the scales are wrong. I'm pretty sure that the two people standing in the bottom right are not the right scale there. <laughs> they don't fit the Big Ben. Big Ben is not that big. Um, and, and so that understanding is kind of all wrong. This map is not correct. But if you're a tourist in London for the first time, it is far more useful as a map than the, than the other one. If I'm looking for St. Paul's Cathedral and I'm standing part of a, another tourist attraction because I'm a tourist, why would it be anywhere else? Then it's easier to get that way than just throwing this map to somebody and tell them, figure it out, jerk. Right? And so the, useful, the usefulness of a map, much like the usefulness of a mental model of how the system works, is directly proportional to what we can predict from that model. The model doesn't have to be good, it doesn't have to be accurate, it doesn't have to be recent, as long as the decisions you make with it are good. And so if you are in an emergency situation because there's an incident and you have this crappy map, you might make better decisions than someone who has the complete view but is unable to navigate it properly. And mental maps don't have to be right, as I said, uh, but they do self-correct only when they are no longer, longer right. There's a kind of philosophical idea that tells you that something does not exist until it breaks, and then you notice it exists. Mental models work the same way. Uh, as long as you work with the wrong mental model and it predicts everything fine, you're going to be good, right? If I have this water-cooled machine that works at home all the time, I'm going to be happy with it. I turn it down, I go to sleep, I'm in Quebec, it, does, uh, it goes below the freezing point, the machine bursts while it's not even running. I get up the next morning, suddenly my world changes. Temperature was not something I considered, but all of a sudden the operating temperature of the world can break the machine even when I'm not using it. The mental models that we build are corrected the same way. They are remaining partial and wrong until we can no longer go that way anymore. And to drive the point a bit better, this is another map of the city of London. It has no building, it has no streets, it has no information whatsoever. It kind of relies on global, on global context that you should have. But this map uh, lets you go further away than any of the other ones. It's a, it's a tube map of London, and it turns out to be excellent for navigation in there. And so when we get back to our systems and the mental models, this is how we work. The little person on the top left probably has a mental model if they are only operating from the logs and the metrics that is based on data flows, which servers or which services communicate with which other components. The people working in the code uh, on the right 
probably have an entirely different vision. And when there's an incident, they will approach it an entirely different way. They might go and say, oh, that's a component that Fred is maintaining. I don't trust Fred. Fred is a jerk. That's probably where the bug is, which is not something that the dude on the, on the top left would ever think about. They're only looking at the numbers. They are using the subway map, and the person on the right are just using entirely different circles of influence. But both might lead to solving some bugs differently in other ways. And this variety of perspectives is what we need to have in an organization to be able to debug things more efficiently. So knowing that it is a very soft topic like that, what can we do? Well, the thing that we do uh, as developers is usually just fix the bug of yesterday and then put visibility in something that's a solved problem. So if this is my application, this is only Windows, no walls, it's a black box. Every time there is a bug, the thing that we do is going to say like, oh, that was a tricky one. I'm going to put a log line there so next time there's no problem. Uh, or it's going to be like, this is error handling code. I put it to do, so I'm just going to put a log in there telling me to fix this later. And then when we run it, it happens a bit like that. You just put more and more windows in your applications, and you hope to find the tricky bugs. But you will never find tricky bugs that way, because tricky bugs, by definition, are bugs that you did not see coming. And so they will be in the red Xs. So all that we have done is add visibility haphazardly into our application, and we created the software engineer's house. <laughs> it has great observability. You can see everything that's inside. It's just a nightmare. And so that's what happens. And so what you do after that is kind of say, well, this is garbage. I don't like it. I'm going to make something where I can see everything all the time. And so this is a glass house. <laughs> and yeah, I like that one. The big problem with the glass house is that it's not helpful either. Right? If from my point of view in my application, I just expose all the operations that appear all the time, it's not a big help. I've worked with a team in the past where uh, they wanted to log everything that went on in the network. And so they added the logging call uh, around every call of the HTTP or TCP libraries that were happening. And of course, that was too much volume. And so they put that into an optional switch that would log everything to disk. So what happened is that when they wanted to debug what was going on, they had to go into the production machine, turn the debug logging on only for all the network probes, and then they would get the full trace there. It's a stupid idea. And the reason for that is that, uh, if you have this kind of glass house approach, you don't know what you're looking for unless you already, like, you need to know what you're looking for to make sense out of it. There's too much noise. It's a completionist view. If you don't have a perfect or a very good mental model of everything, you don't know what to look for or where to find it. And if you have a very good mental model and you, and, and you know what to look for and how to find it, you're not going to use that, right? If you want to get the network information, Ask anyone who's debugged the network. They're going to be used TCP dump or Wireshark. They're not going to use the stupid switch for logs on the network stuff. <laughs> and so really, that's the thing that's going to happen. A glass house model where everything in the application is trying to provide visibility for everything else is just not going to work well at all, right? If you don't have a good model, it's useless. You cannot form a new model. There's too much information. If you know what you're looking for, you're not using it either. So all you have is a bunch of information nobody cares about. Instead, an approach that's interesting is to base ourselves a bit into what uh, operating systems will do. So operating systems, especially like Linux or BSD, tend to give you a lot of probes that you have at a low level. You look at the operating system, it is going to give you stuff that has to do with network drivers, I.O. of all kinds, disk, memory, all that kind of stuff. And you will notice if you use them that none of them necessarily require you to know how the code is written within the operating system. The thing that they provide is a good clue about how you interact with the, with the operating system. And that's kind of the key here. What you want to provide when you provide debugging information is information about the interactions. You want to provide a kind of story where the user of your components have their idea of how it works. And you don't know what it is, but they're able to figure out and get information uh, without understanding what's underneath. And so if we put everything in the application, and that's roughly the glass house or the, the, the software engineer's house, we are taking on the responsibility at the application layer of providing visibility into the framework, the libraries, the standard library, the language, the operating system, and everything like that. And that's a huge task that nobody can do really, really well. So what we should do instead is use that layered approach. And it was nice to see it in Maxim's presentation because they had that layered approach of probes at every level that they were uh, monitoring and everything. So what I should do is, well, there's stuff that if I'm using a, progr a programming language and I want to debug stuff, I use the programming language feature. I don't debug the stuff from my own stuff, uh, from my own probes in there. If I have an application, I should not be providing logs to debug the application within the application. 
Because if there's a problem with the application, I shouldn't be able to trust it logs. It's buggy. If I'm using the application logs, it's because I'm trying to understand how I am using the application. If you're using a web server like Nginx, nothing asks you to understand the internals of Nginx. They tell you about the configuration that you have set. They tell you about the requests it has re received. It tells you about the data you care about. But all the logs that you have to use there have nothing to do with the internals of the tools. And so the logs that we emit from within our application should be entirely limited to the interactions of the user or the operator with the application itself. If I want to debug the application, then it, it, it follows that I should not be using the logs of the application. I should be putting them a layer below. And so if you're using a web framework, for example, a lot of them have a concept of middlewares or plugs if you're using Phoenix or something like that. And what's interesting with these is that if in the framework itself there are logs or probes or metrics that are put for these probes there, it's going to be a single probe point that you put in the application. It's not hard to maintain. But if the user uses 50 different middlewares, they get the logs for them for free. Whereas if I try to do it in the application, I have to put 50 probe points myself. And that's garbage and it gets to be ugly and hard to maintain and very difficult. And so that layering is really critical. And what's interesting is that uh, you want to use a stack. If you care about your operators, you want to use a stack that is friendly to that kind of layered approach, where you can use different levels of expertise for different operators, digging at different levels to figure out what's happening. And so we're playing with a concept that is uh, similar to operator experience. We have user experience, where we try to make an intuitive application without documentation. You're able to figure it out with different levels, expert users, beginner users, something like that. Nobody really gives a shit about the operators, but we should be doing the same thing. And that layering, I think, is kind of the key to do it. And so to get back with the systems Bible, the crucial variables are discovered by accident. You don't know what you don't know until it blows up into your face. That's what updates a model. That's what makes you fix things. When everything correlates with everything, things will never settle down. And they do that on side effects. If you're trying to tweak a button, but then everything moves forever, you don't know if you have any effect. The same is kind of true with um, the glass house approach to logging and metrics. If all you get is a white wall of noise of all metrics of everything, you have no idea to build a model out of it. It's too complex. Uh, a system is no better than its sensory organs, meaning that if you, cannot see it, if you cannot see it happening, it's not happening until it breaks something else and then you can infer the state. But if it's not visible, it's not there. And the meaning of a communication is the behavior that results. I love the last quote there. Essentially, if you're sending information somewhere, nobody uses it, nobody does anything about it, it is meaningless. It has meaning if it is actionable, if you can do something about it. Alerting works that way. Logging should work the same way. Metrics should work the same way. There is nothing worse for an operator than trying to figure out why the system is behaving weirdly, and all you have is a dashboard with 50 different metrics that you don't know what they mean, but they all correlate with each other randomly. So one reflex that we might have is to just say, well, what the hell? The best way to please my operators is to not have operators. I'm just going to automate everything. And so uh, here I am the agent. And I might be looking at my system here. I have a database. There's a single master. If the database goes down, the thing is going to happen. Gonna, I'm going to look at it and say, oh, the master is down. I'm just going to switch the configuration. The follower one is the new master. Follower two now follows from follower one. And then I update the configuration, and everything works. And so it might be interesting to say, I'm just going to automate that, and then my operators don't need to think about it anymore. The problem is that there's a thing called the law of requisite variety. And what it says, essentially, is that uh, any action in a system can only be undone or corrected by something that has the same flexibility to counteract that action. And if you don't have that, you cannot do anything to fix it. Uh, the other thing that it tells you is that whatever you are able to model in your system uh, is the limit of the control you can have. And so this is very interesting because it's basically an upper bound into what you can automate and what you cannot automate. If I get back to the databases and I replace myself as an agent and I put it with something that's a piece of software like that, I get different scenarios that are a bit fun. Right? It's possible that when I get the call, I look on the website, see that everything is down, and then I can know for sure because I'm outside of the data center that yes, the master appears to be down. If I do it in an agent that is sitting in the same data center as my stuff, and I take a shortcut because it's hard to do a full round trip by the application, and I just use the health check for the agent, then all of a sudden, the agent doesn't know about net split necessarily. 
and then it's able to take wrong actions. So maybe it will do the, sh the switch of configuration from the first follower, second follower, change the config in the clients. But the old master is still alive, and now I've just corrupted data. And now what's super interesting is that as an operator, I'm stuck trying to debug that system. And I don't have to understand the system itself. I have to understand the system itself, and then the understanding of the system by the agent, and then the actions of the agent on the system to be able to undo all of that and change it. And that's the big problem with the law of requisite variety, right? The understanding of the system here is incomplete. It's not just up or down. It's not just master follower or something like that. It's up, down, and don't know. There's a net split, something like that. And so I have added tremendous complexity to the system on behalf of the operator because I wanted to save them work. And so uh, the thing that we have to care about at that point is figuring out that some automation might save a lot of work on mundane tasks but renders the overall system so complex that it becomes very, very hard to operate. Uh, a thing that an automated agent should do is related to what teams do. And what teams do is essentially what a good teammate would do. Right? If you are having trouble, you tell your other teammates. If you are starting a risky operation, you are telling everyone else. If you feel you are reaching your limits, you tell somebody else. If you feel that your coworker is not doing a good job or they're having trouble, you go and help them. Who here has written automation that does this? No hands raised, either you're all sleeping or nobody has written a smart agent. I'm gonna say that it's a smart agent, nobody has written it. And so the problem that we have with that is that it's exceedingly hard. And so we should be asking the question, is it worth doing or do I just automate something that doesn't require that kind of coordination? And so for the systems Bible, we get the quote, an extra brain in the tail, the tail wags on its own schedule. If you put a drain into something, it's going to be independent, you no longer control it. Uh, the system itself does not do what it says it is doing. Uh, the control is exercised by the element of the greatest variety of behavioral response. This is a human being. There is pretty much no system where everything goes down, it's still the computer making a decision. There is a human who has to act as a backstop for everything that's happening. So this is interesting to keep in mind when what we're doing is automation. Because essentially it means that whatever automation we do, we have to keep in mind that there's a human that's going to debug something somewhere. And we have to be careful about what we do. And the little rule of thumb I have for that is the last point, and I freaking love that quote. If it's worth doing at all, it's worth doing poorly. <laughs> and here's my interpretation of that. If I'm trying to figure out if I want to automate something, I ask myself, if I do a half-assed job, is it still going to be useful? And sometimes the answer is gonna, see, is gonna be yes. It's like, this is tedious as hell. I don't wanna do it all the time. Just like, do it that way. I don't care if it's not perfect. It's better than me doing it by hand. This is worth automating. If the answer is no, it has to be perfect because otherwise it's going to be a huge nightmare and everything's gonna be broken, then by God, don't automate that. Because you're not gonna do a perfect job and I'm not gonna do a perfect job either. So I will only automate things that I'm allowed to be shitty at, even if I'm gonna try to do a good job at it. But I, at least I know that if I make a mistake, it's not going to ruin someone's life. And so that's one of the ways that you figure out what to automate. Um, we can get back to what can we do as Erlang and Elixir developers, right? Logging, use structured logging. If you just log with a sentence that says something like, this is a bug that happened for this reason or something, get out of here. Because if you have logs like that and you're trying to search them, you, you, you just need a full text search engine to, come to understand your logs, that's garbage. You want structured logs that are based on keys and values and structures that you can just write tools for to help, right? And the tools don't have to be perfect. You can do a crappy job at them because it's still better than just looking at all the logs by hand and read me uh, in uh, words.txt or whatever the, the tool is on Windows, I don't recall. It doesn't handle break lines anyway. Um, Everything you log, log it at the level you want it in production. There is nothing, well, there's a lot of worse things, but there's nothing worse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of worse things than that, but you, you go in a system, you turn on the logs, and then you crash the system because there's too much logs, too much logging for what you need. Like, there's worse things than that, but that's not fun. It's like, okay, I just ruined the system for no reason. It was useless. Uh, structured logging, super useful. Uh, and do mention only facts things that are happening. You don't want to provide interpretation from within the code because you don't have the context to provide an interpretation. The interpretation should be left to the human. That's still automation, right? And so the best example I've seen about that was a piece of software that would check SSL certificates before downloading something. 
And it just assumed that everything would be update, up, the, up to date forever. It was an old piece of software that was not very good. And when at some point it, it became too old to do proper SSL, it started telling people, error, you are being hacked. <laughs> and so what happens when you do that is that you get that crappy message that means nothing because the person writing the code expected that everyone would maintain their infrastructure properly is that suddenly you have a user who is not necessarily technical, panicking that they're being hacked. They have no idea how to solve it, not more than if it were a technical log with just an event like that. They have no actionable action, they have no way to do anything about it. And what's interesting is that not only are they losing time trying to understand that, they are losing trust in the information that your system is giving them. So what happens in the long term is that you're trying to provide logs and be useful in what you do. And all that happens is that people disregard them because this is garbage software and you don't trust what they're, what they're saying. Somewhere there's an operator with as many tattoos as the guy in Memento, just like don't trust their words. <laughs> so what we can do is just, yeah, that's what we provide in our application. You have metrics, you all of that, there's a lot of resources. What's interesting is how do we get to the lower layers? Maximus mentioned a few of them. Um, I like Sys-Trace uh, for some OTP processes. It's not super great for high performance stuff, but it's given to us by the framework. And this is interesting because if there is Sys-Trace, I don't need to do print statement debugging with that. It tells me about which messages are received by an OTP process, which responses are being sent. I turn it on something like that, and this is a little ping pong client in UDP, and it's just gonna tell me all the messages. And I just turn that on and off with a simple switch on as many servers as I want. I don't need to compile anything, it's just there. Uh, there's a slightly more advanced version called log, and the only thing it does is that instead of just outputting them to standard output, it keeps them in a little circular buffer in your process, and you can go fetch them by calling get, and you get them. And starting with OTP22, which has a new release candidate as of this week, uh, when the process dies, it also outputs the logs that were pre-accumulated in there, which is pretty freaking sweet. So you get that for free. You can turn that on in the start link arguments to a gen server process. So even if you're writing tests, not just doing it in production, you can debug your tests with that far more easily than it would be to just put a crap load of print statement in there. More advanced versions, sys install. Instead of just getting the events output or accumulated, you can put a call back in there and do what you want with them. Forward them, send them to another process, play with them. I've used this in tests before, instead of doing mocking or uh, intercepting arguments or something, it's just like, I'm gonna do my call, put the message in there, and just send me the events to the test process, and then I'm able to trace what is going on without any additional machinery. Just put the call in the test itself. It's a feature of the language, it's fine. And then you have uh, get status, get state, replace state, that's kind of risky. Uh, it, it's been mentioned before. It's, it's kind of neat when you need it, but you hope you don't need it. Uh, if you drop from the framework, then you can get to the virtual machine level. Uh, I've written an entire small book about that, the Erlang and Anger stuff, tells you about uh, uh, all, all that kind of things. Uh, so I will defer to the book instead of reading it in front of you. Microstate accounting, Maxim has mentioned it. This is how you call it by hand, as he said. Um, and, and it is pretty nice to get more advanced stuff. I didn't cover it in the book, so it is interesting. If you wanna do tracing, tracing at the Erlang or Elixir level, you have cool applications like Rexbog where you can just have like this inum.member function, put the arguments, it's in a string, and it's going to tell you all the calls that happen with it. I'm personally a fan of Recon Trace because I wrote it, so it, it's the way I like it. Um, and it works kind of the same, it has a different way to trigger on stuff, it has all these kinds of things. You can get the return values, you can trace on private functions without needing to recompile them in a special shell that you have built for that. <laughs> you can just get the values out of it with that. Uh, and you're able to get the values that you want. Uh, but that's still at the virtual machine, at the language level, you have these trace functions. What can we get if we go deeper? Well, you, we get into the operating system stuff and it's fine. You got here, for example, perf. Uh, perf on Linux, perf top, this is how uh, we debugged back when I was at Heroku problems with the SSL application. It just tells you the C functions that the VM is running in a top-like interface and where the CPU is going. And here, what we could find was these function called do minor, which is garbage collection. And um, db next hash get hash select delete hash, which I didn't necessarily know what they meant, just went in there, figured out it was related to uh, the select delete ets operation. Then I ran the trace that I had in there on the production node to see who is calling select delete all the time. Turns out it was the SSL manager, and we found a bottleneck in there that when we removed it, was rendered the, the code five times faster. 
But we could do that with about half an hour of investigation and poking around. No need to compile to check anything. We just use the tools that are available. One thing that you can use, dtrace and system tap. dtrace on BSDs and BSDs like, system tap on Linux. Uh, you can create scripts, one-liners, entire libraries of debugging tools based on that. Uh, you can look up all the system calls, a bunch of functions that are happening. Uh, and Erlang is pretty neat because it's all instrumented to run with that. You just need to compile the right switch uh, when you build the system. Uh, and one of the really, really cool things that not a lot of people talk about is the dintrace module. And the dintrace module, essentially what it lets you do is use system tap or dtrace to do your entire stack from the operating system to the Erlang functions. It's just a bunch of functions in like dintrace colon p and then a bunch of arguments that are really meaningless, but you can put them the way you want and they become visible within uh, system tap and dtrace scripts. And so you're able to check everything from the operating system to the top of your applications if you need to debug that way. Here is, um, this one is a dtrace, uh, no, that one is a system tap script. And what it tries to do, for example, is say when someone calls genudp send and the inet udp send, which is the underlying function, basically this will trace me how much time is being spent preparing a packet to be sent over UDP before it even leaves a virtual machine. I run that in a little thing like that and it takes like 11 to 14 microseconds. Uh, just last week I debugged a case where it would take something like more than a second and it turns out that someone passed an IP address as a string and then that goes through a full um, DNS resolving because if it's a tuple it's an IP, if it's a string otherwise it goes the other way and then you don't need to dig. It's just like a little bit of binary search like that with trace probes and you find out that all you need to do is look up the IP once and then the system was seven times faster. That's great. Um, dtrace looks a bit like that. I personally prefer dtrace as a format and as a little language. This one I wrote when I, write, when I wanted to debug uh, low performance of rebar 3 on FreeBSD on a Raspberry Pi, which is a very common platform. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, it could take a lot of time to figure out why the hell is this thing slow. And then I wrote the thing that just like, show me all the freaking system calls that have to do with whatever and just give me the time. I'm just going to ask for the version. It would take me three seconds to get the version of the tool. And then I found out that all these calls had to do with polling, select and whatnot. And it turns out to be file access. And so I wrote a second script on the side just like give me the file names of everything I'm opening. And it turns out it was just loading Erlang modules to start the e-script. The problem was just that I had a shitty SD card. And trying to debug that with print statement would have taken days. But with just a little dtrace script like that, you can just look at whatever you need and dig through and up the system. All you need to do is to have the right kind of understanding and that's where the mental models come in play. Uh, and so one thing I have, uh, of course, I'm going to mention my latest book. Uh, <laughs> but it's something that I found interesting uh, in trying to build a model for testing the software is that you're also trying to come up with a model at all. And it turns out that for some pieces of code that we write, coming up with a model is super hard. And then that kind of begs the question, if I, the developer writing the code, cannot figure out how to model this, how the hell is an operator going to do it? It's kind of impossible. So it's a kind of interesting proxy for that. It's like code coverage, right? 100% code coverage does not tell you that you have good tests, but 0% code coverage is a pretty good sign that you have shitty tests. <laughs> and so being able to write a model as a property is not going to tell you that you have uh, a great way to model your software. But being unable to come up with one is probably a good sign that nobody else is going to be able to do it either. Um, another thing that's uh, yeah, kind of interesting with that is that frankly, any kind of modeling like that is probably worthwhile. Try to write documentation, try to uh, use, well, TLA plus is kind of harder, but just trying to write documentation forces you to create that kind of model to give an explanation. And if you have a hard time writing documentation, it's gonna be hard for people to operate your software. The other big tip I would give is that practice makes perfect. And the best way to learn how to use debugging tools in production for your operators is to use them in development. Don't use a debugger that you would not use in production. Only use production tool in development. And so uh, you can play still with the uh, little breakpoints that you have both in Rebar 3 Shell, which I want to demo as a lightning talk tonight, and you have them in Nix as well. And the thing that you can do is isolate the test that you know is failing and try to use the tools that the virtual machine, the language, the frameworks, the operating system gives you to debug the bug in your software because this is what an operator would have to do. And so with this, having a failing test, figure out, can you just use 
um, the sys stuff, the system stuff uh, in OTP. Can you do it with dtrace? Can you do it with tracing? What can you do to figure out where there's a problem? Test your hypothesis directly in a test case using these and get some practice in development to use it in production. What you might find out is that uh, essentially your software is not debuggable with production tools and nobody's gonna have a chance. What do you need to change in your software to make it better? And otherwise, what kind of tools? It's a great learning opportunity. So that would be, uh, yeah, my last point, practice makes perfect. Do we have any questions?